How do you describe what you do for work when you meet someone at a cocktail party? I like to say that I help people go where you're treated best. Those are five magic words. I learned them from my father at a very young age. He gave me a permission slip. I did not have to stick around where I'm from. Um, I didn't have to stick around and take care of my parents because they didn't want their kids taking care of them. They wanted their kids to go where the best opportunities were. And he thought back in the 1990s, where I grew up in the United States, that there would be better opportunities by the time I got around to being in business. And so what I've discovered is if you live in the United States or if you live in a country like it, you're probably paying way too much in tax. I'm not saying you should pay zero, but you're probably paying too much for what you're getting. Um, there's probably some things holding you back. Uh, I think what we're seeing now is there's a lot of opportunities in business around the world and increasingly this multipolarity where the U.S. is pitted against other places. And so there's going to be a choice, which market do you want to sell to? Uh, and so we help people at Nomad Capitalist reduce taxes, become dual citizens, find opportunities around the world that most people don't talk about because uh, I'm a pretty contrarian guy. And I think that what we think is the best is often not. It's strange having read and listened to a good bit of your work. It's <laughs> from first principles, it's kind of weird that people presume, well, this is the place that I was born. So this is the place that I'm supposed to work and live and die and bank and pay taxes and date, all of these things. Date. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, you know, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio in the U.S., uh, right on the lake and right across the lake from Canada. And I look and I say, what if, you know, I've been born right across that lake? I mean, the grand scheme of things, that lake is a pretty small, pretty small thing. And if you're Canadian... Uh, you can leave your country and you can leave your tax burden behind for one thing. You don't have to follow Canadian regulations when you live overseas. Uh, you have a passport that for years, I mean, it's, it's the joke uh, that people respect you a lot more and people are more open to giving you a bank account in other countries. Just think like life as a global citizen is a lot easier. Life just as a Canadian traveling is a lot easier. Um, you know, people aren't picking on you. And to say that you're born that close to where your identity would have been different. I mean, to me, just shows you know, the miracle of birth. But not only, you know, if you, the movie Midnight in Paris talked about, you know, were we born in the wrong part of, you know, Earth's history? You know, would you have rather been born 50 years ago? You know, we can't change when we were born, but we can certainly change where we were born. And if we weren't born in a place that we want, um, we can change that. I also happen to think, as my father said, Sure. When I was born in 1984, the United States, according to the, stu the studies that do this, it was the best place to be born. But there wasn't a lot of competition. I'm talking to you from Malaysia. I think it's the best value destination in the world for someone who can work from anywhere. And you would have never even been talking about it in 1984, but you can talk about it today. And so there's a lot more competition. The world changes. The world evolves. And even if you were born in the right place, maybe it's not the right place today. What about cultural displacement? I was born in the UK. I now live in America on an O1 visa, and yep. I there's part of me that that does feel culturally displaced. You know, a lot of the um, way markers that you would references and things from history and things from your past and stuff from culture and stuff from all the rest of it that that can be a little bit disquieting. What's that like as a global citizen? Well, obviously, different places have different cultures. I think that if you look at it, in a sense, we're all the same. Obviously, we all have the same motivations. Um, in a sense, we're very different. There are places that I think it is difficult to adapt. Um, I think that part of my background in the United States, coming from a very humble background, probably caused me at times to spend a bit more time in places where people were a bit less agreeable um, because you're, t you're taught you know, where I'm from uh, that you know, look inwardly first. Uh, but let's take Malaysia, for example. I think you have probably some of the kindest people in the world. It's a quality that I've looked at as being extremely important. Um, I look at a place that I've spent more time in the last year next to where you're from in Ireland. Um, some of the most polite and kind people uh, and welcoming people in the world. They've done an incredible job you know, transforming their country in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and I say to myself, I mean, those are important markers. So I think that the things that we're used to uh, sure, there's places where I go and I still have an American mindset and it's frustrating. And I was just, you know, just talked to my team yesterday. We've got people all over the place. 
you know, we're going to run this like a business run by a guy who's from the United States. And yet, being out of the United States for many, many years causes one to develop an international mindset to where if I were to go back to the U.S. today, I think I'd feel very culturally displaced from there because, number one, I'm politically homeless. I don't agree with Trump on everything. I certainly don't agree with Biden on everything. Um, and yet, if you don't agree on everything, it seems for a lot of people, you're a communist or you're a fascist. Um, I think that people are at each other's throats where I'm from. I think that would be the ultra, ultimate cultural displacement that someone who's kind of developed an international sense of um, of thought wouldn't be very welcome there today. How many passports and bank accounts and stuff do you have? I think it's five passports now. Always looking for a new. I, I, I had a coach. He said, how about, we, how about one new passport and one new property a year? The properties I decided I, I kind of got pied-a-terres around the world because I like to split my time up, have employees in different places, kind of got tired of staying in hotels. But okay, the passports, I think for now, I'm good. Um, yeah, we've opened probably dozens of bank accounts all over the world. We have multiple companies around the world. Um, we invest in things like stocks all around the world. Um, and as I said, I mean, we're really, at, at my business, Nomad Capitalist, I mean, we're expanding uh, to hire people around the world. We've largely been kind of Europe focused over the years, um, but we're really doing a lot of work now in Latin America, um, hopefully soon in Asia. So I mean, for me, they call it planting flags. I want to have as many flags as possible, uh, but I want them to be correspondent to what the opportunity is. I live in Malaysia because as someone who can work from, and I live in Malaysia most of the winters now, as someone who can work from anywhere and who can live anywhere, for me, the idea of paying $10 million for this apartment um, and then paying 5 or $6 million in tax because Singapore can demand that just as a one-time you know, purchase for a foreigner, I don't have to do that. To live in a place that's marginally easier uh, to live in than Malaysia where you know this place is 600 grand and everybody marvels at how cheap that is for what you get. Uh, and yet, if I want a bank... I trust Malaysian banks, but Singaporean banks to me are the gold standard. So I'm looking for all the places around the world where I can take advantage of what are you the best at? And the reality is when we say, you know, go where you're treated best, the place where you're from, they're probably not the best at anything. Um, The U.S. does not have the best banks. They don't have the safest banks. I mean, they have the most bank failures of any country in the world combined. Um, So, but if they are, if they are the best at something, you should, you should, you should use it for that. I'm looking for places that are the best and I'm planting flags there. And I think places all around the world are the best at something. How do you conceptualize the different elements that a person has to manage or play with? Uh, country of residence, bank accounts, tax status, stuff like that. Is there a, a series of knobs and levers that we're playing with? Yeah, I think so. I mean, what, what I decided to do in our business was to make it based on what I've experienced. I mean, a lot of people out there will help you get a passport in the Caribbean. Um, but I thought there's a real world challenge of going out and doing this. To, it can be tough. I mean, you go to banks, a lot of banks don't want to take non-residents these days, for example. But yeah, I, I broke it down and I'm continuing to add things to this day. I mean, you mentioned dating. I think that's a great one to add. Where should you be dating? Um, I just had a, a, a guy who works for me. He lived in Ireland. He broke up with his girlfriend of seven years. Okay, obviously there's a bit of the rebound phase going on. But I took him to a couple of our offices. We had some work to do around uh, other parts of kind of Eastern Europe. And it was a dramatic shock that like, wow, these people are much more interested in me uh, than maybe someone back home where I'm just kind of standard fare. And I think that if you just look at everything in life and saying, am I doing this the best? People probably ask themselves similar questions just without the geographical element. So I decided to add this overlay of geography to it. Okay, so tax is one that's important, how much tax you are paying, Uh, ability to invest, bank accounts, quality of life. What else am I missing from the big big buckets? Where's your company based? Which, I mean, in in part is based on where you live, right? I mean, so the, 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 the mistake is if you live in the United States, but you put your company in the British Virgin Islands, you can avoid tax. I mean, they figure that one out, right? I mean, you have to... To move as well. But if you live in a tax friendly place like a Malaysia, um, you can have your company in a number of places that serve you well. Um, where are you hiring people? 
where do people have the best attitudes? Um, I don't know that we're paying people that much less than we'd pay them in the US. Um, they're certainly probably keeping more money than they would to an equivalent American, but we can start off paying them less to begin with and then quickly scale them up. Once the risk is, risk is reduced, we can hire more people, try more things. Um, so I think for a business owner, those are important elements. Where's your business based? Where are the employees based? And they all work together. But then again, there's the personal things. Where's your data stored? Um, you know, if you're in crypto, I think people should perhaps have a ledger and the ledger should be stored somewhere. That's an asset haven. Where's your precious metals stored? Um, you know, I, 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 I've always liked lightweight business models my entire life. I've started my first business at 19. I never wanted to have a business where I had to buy a ton of assets. I had to have a factory. I think it's a business because then you could just be profitable immediately and then you scale uh, and nobody owns you. I think the same thing about life. If I want to live in Malaysia, do I really want to be you know, dragged down to all my stuff is stored in Malaysia? If I own certain investments, it's all sitting in my living room. I, I want to run a kind of a lightweight lifestyle where I'm flexible. Um, I think that's the name of the game this in this century. What's the difference, can you explain to me, between owning a passport, being a citizen, being a resident, having a visa? What, what, what do all of these different things mean? Citizens, so, I mean, generally speaking, citizens are entitled to get a passport. There's some things where, you know, a stateless person can apply for a passport and then what's the nationality. But generally speaking, if you're a citizen, you can apply for a passport. So a passport's a travel document. You want to be a citizen. Um, you know, I've been talking, there's there's kind of a, the latest version of an old scam, the Mexican passport scam, where some guy puts your name in the system and they can print out a passport but you don't have any of the formal stuff that shows you've actually been naturalized. And eventually, at least historically speaking, people start traveling these passports and they eventually have a problem because you're not really a citizen. So you want to go through the proper channels to become a citizen and therefore to get a passport. Um, so there's any number of ways to get a passport. You know, If you have a, a parent or a grandparent or a great grandparent in many cases who comes from somewhere, you could potentially go back and get that citizenship. You can go back. So you, have, you can go back to a great grandparents' generation and knock on the door of the embassy and say, "Hey, I fancy a passport." In some, they even took it back even further. Um, like Italy, for example, as long as Italy existed, or Slovakia, they even went back one one further recently. Yeah, um, you have to get your documents. Obviously, the further back, the harder it is to prove. And there are some exceptions, like in the case of Italy, if somebody became American before you were before the next one was born, there was no dual citizenship. I mean, there's some caveats. But yeah, you can go back through your family tree and you can track that and you can get a citizenship that way. There's citizenships you can invest in, um, about a dozen formal programs and a number of informal programs where if you're starting a business and hiring 20 people, there's probably a country that would like to give you citizenship in exchange for doing that. If you want to make a donation to a Caribbean country, they'll give you a passport in a matter of months. And then, of course, you can just go and live in some country and eventually become naturalized two or three years in Argentina, up to you know 30 years in San Marino in, in Europe, you know, or, or something like that. Um, and so to be a resident gives you permission to live somewhere. A country like Malaysia is never really going to give anybody citizenship. Asian countries, it's not really their thing. Citizenship is kind of an ethnic thing, but you can be a resident. And so I can have a residence permit for a certain period of time, as long as I you know keep my nose clean, as long as I maintain whatever got me the permit, whether I'm married to a citizen, whether I invested, whether I did you know started a company, I'm a resident. If you're a resident in a European country, you can you know if you go to the UK, six years, you live there X number of days a year. Eventually, you can apply for citizenship. And so, you know, there's different ways to look at this. <clears throat> Ireland, for example, if you live there for five years, you can apply for citizenship arguably one of the best passports in the world, not only in the European Union, but also has access. You can live and work in the UK. Everyone likes the Irish. Um, and yet you can live in Ireland for those five years as a special tax status that locals don't have, but that foreigners can avail themselves of. So you could live in Ireland, speak English, have all the services, pay some tax, but not the full 52% people are paying on their salaries and then get one of the best passports in the world. So there's different ways to approach it. Plenty of Americans now just want it. They want a residence permit in Mexico or Argentina or Malaysia as a place to go and be welcomed. They want a citizenship just in case something happens. Uh, they want a citizenship because I think in the future, being an American will be bad for global business. Uh, and I've seen that myself. Um, but some people want to move. So it's, you know, is this a plan B? 
Is it a backup? Or is it like, hey, what I did, I don't want to live here anymore. How do I move somewhere else? How do I navigate the world? Yeah. how Just how badly does the US rank on your global list of places from a tax and financial perspective? And if we ranked it on t- tax, I mean, it is the one country that just across the board taxes citizens no matter where they live. Here's the international view. I'm a pretty libertarian guy. I believe in lower taxes. I don't know why you have to pay so much tax in the US, especially because you get nothing. Even my father shares the same view. He likes to travel to Germany now. He likes to travel to Europe. He's like, all right, you know what? At least here they're getting something. You don't get anything in the US. And even all that said, I know no one ever signed up to pay high taxes, but if you live there, you know the deal in the US, you got to pay the high taxes. If you don't want to pay them, you should be allowed to leave. But the US is the one country that without restriction taxes you no matter where you live. Now, if you're a business owner, you can incorporate your business somewhere offshore. You can pay yourself as an employee of that offshore company and, and legally not have social security tax. You can exempt a whole bunch of money. You can defer additional money at a pretty low rate. I'm not saying you're going to move overseas and pay the exact same taxes. We help Americans pay a lot, lot less, but you still have to file. You still have to keep track of all the rules. Um, that what happened when I gave up my U.S. citizenship was I was suddenly able to access a lot more of my company's capital. Our company is a cash flow company. We don't have to reinvest at all for our growth. I took some money out. I built the collection of pied de up. So now I can travel around and live the lifestyle that I talk about, always having someone comfortable to go. I couldn't do that. I've got an apartment here in Kuala Lumpur that's owned by a company. Nobody in the jurisdiction of the company understands it. Nobody in Malaysia understands it. It was done for one reason. It's the legal way for me to acquire real estate as a US citizen without paying a huge amount of tax. And so there's all these restrictions that Americans have. Again, if you stay in the US, pay your taxes. If you want to vote, if you think Trump's going to lower your income tax rate 2%, good luck. But if you leave, you should be allowed to leave. And I think that Australia is tiptoeing in the way that the US is going. Canada, there's been people talking about it. There's this notion now that citizenship is not as much a privilege as it is a responsibility. It's an obligation. That even if you don't drive on the roads, even if you don't send your kids to the schools, why aren't you paying? Because you're American. You should pay for the privilege. Well, what is that? I didn't choose to be born here. And again, I was born 50 miles from Canada. And so for me, that's what's pretty unfair. And so in that regard, it must rank like the lowest of all. I mean, my friend is from Norway. And if he just leaves the country and moves to Dubai in the first three years, uh, he has to pay a certain amount of tax. But after that three years, he's done. And if he moves to any number of nice countries that they like, he's done. So that's like a that's like a very, very small version of what the U.S. does. But the U.S., for as long as you are a U.S. citizen, you have to pay. And you know what? If I liked the U.S. so much, I'd be willing to pay that low rate of tax. But for me, the issue is I think it's offensive that there's this idea that since the Civil War, just having that citizenship means you should have to pay. If I live there, I'll gladly pay. That's the deal. I was fully compliant when I lived there. I didn't agree with the rates, but you follow the law. I think people should have the chance to leave. And I think anything else is kind of like uh, it's abuse. Isn't there, wasn't there one other country with that global tax thing? So, yeah, it was funny because I had an employee of mine that said, oh, I have an Eritrean taxi driver, this Eastern African country next to Ethiopia. I guess it broke away from Ethiopia in the 90s, I think. And they imposed a diaspora tax. I think it was 2% uh, on anybody who's living overseas. And I think that they're like, oh, if you want to renew your passport, show us you pay the tax. It really wasn't enforced because as you can imagine, like the United States has a lot more global power to influence banks and set up IRS offices and everything else than Eritrea does. Um, you know, war-torn kind of the North Korea of Africa. Um, and she's like, yeah, the guy says he doesn't pay the, the diaspora tax. Uh, so yeah, they do it. Um, again, there's other countries that in limited circumstances do it. Australia is kind of tiptoeing in. I think you'll see more countries doing a de facto version of it, as in it's already kind of the fact that if you're leaving a country like Australia or like Canada, maybe, um, and you just kind of live a totally digital nomad lifestyle with no base, eh, did you really leave? Maybe you should still pay us. So it's getting worse which is why I think having second passports is important. 
I'm not opposed to paying. Listen, I, I, I will spend some time in Ireland and I will pay something. But I don't think, I mean, for 50% of your income, you know, it's easy to make 40 grand and to say, hey, I'm happy to pay my, my four grand. No one's arguing about that. When you run a business that makes a lot of money and the government almost gets in your way more than uh, they're helping you, and you realize, well, wait a second, over there, they're doing it with 5% tax. What, why do you need 50? And oh, by the way, have you been to Dubai recently? The roads are a heck of a lot better than they are in Cleveland, where I'm from. What, where's this money going? So uh, I, I think there's a certain class of countries where they're clamping down because they don't like the competition that I'm talking about. They don't realize I can come to Malaysia with a territorial tax system. My company can be based somewhere else. Maybe I'll pay a little bit of tax on my own personal salary, but my company will be entirely tax free and I can take a dividend and I can pay a couple of percentage points of tax at the most. And I, I support the, comp- the country. I buy a lot of stuff. Maybe I employ some people. And they're happy with that. Australia and the US and Canada don't like that. Malaysia does like that. What is the process of saying, I don't want to be an American anymore? What is that? You go to a US embassy overseas. Obviously, all the embassies are overseas. Hang on. Hang on. So you have to leave. <laughs> you, you can't tell America in America that you don't want to be American anymore. No, because once you, right, because generally speaking, there's two appointments. You go in the first appointment, they kind of explain it to you. Are you sure you want to do it? Okay. And then generally it's like, come back. It could be, you know, the same day. It could be a week from now. It could be six months from now in some, some countries, depends on which embassy you're dealing with. Um, but after that second appointment, you, you leave your passport and you walk out and you're still in this kind of transitional status. The state department hasn't approved it yet. Um, which is generally it's kind of just a de facto process. Um, but I mean, you're you're in a sense not an American anymore. So I mean, I, you you can't walk out back onto U.S. soil like they're they're going to deport you to where? Oh, I mean, of course! Wow, yeah, yeah. I didn't even you're I done. didn't even think of that. How funny! So there, I yeah. mean, if you didn't plan this correctly, you could have no passport. They generally like they'll ask me, and I will say, the most professional experience I've ever had with the U.S. government was my expatriation, like. I would even say kind uh, with the people. Now, not everyone has that experience, um, but I did. And they're like, hey, we want to make sure, can, you know, do you, you want to show us you have another passport just to make sure we don't want you to be stateless? There is, There are a couple of people who've chosen to be stateless, and then they have to go and like get some stateless travel document. It's really confusing. No one's ever going to understand. <laughs> like, don't, don't travel if you want to do that. It, it, you're going to have a tough life. But yeah, I mean, theoretically, I guess if the embassy doesn't force you to, uh, not every and not embassy, not every embassy is going to force you to prove that you have another passport. Um, I remember there's a story of a guy back when dual citizenship was far less common. I met this guy who lives in Vanuatu. He renounced in the 70s because he wanted to become a Vanuatu citizen to be on equal footing for business, and you could not be dual, so he had to give up the U.S. There's no U.S. embassy in Vanuatu, so he flew to Australia. They took his passport. He's like, "Well, how do I leave Australia now?" They're like, "Well, that's not our problem." And there was this whole discussion of like. Well, you can just hang out for ninety days, and we'll deport you, and we'll we'll figure out where to deport you to. And then Free eventually, he back to Vanuatu. Else. Back to Vanuatu. Eventually, he got like an emergency passport or something, and he got sent back. But wow, um, yeah, I mean, there is a little bit of planning required. Yeah, Jesus. What about exit tax? When you left, is the is there what is that? Is there such a thing? So, yeah, there's the U.S. has an exit tax. By the way, a lot of countries, I mean, this is one thing people pick on the U.S. I get why they do it. Um, Because the idea is, if you made a whole bunch of money here, you don't just get to wipe the slate clean and pretend that money wasn't made while you were a U.S. citizen. Um, Much of my wealth now was made when I was living overseas. We can't argue it's those roads and bridges that are doing it for me. But... um, they would say, well, you were still a U.S. citizen. You still had our support. Um, if you have $2 million or more, if you earned, uh, what's the inflation adjusted number for this year? I don't know. Probably if you, if you, if you pay like 800 and some thousand dollars in income tax federally over the last five years, if that's what your income tax bill was for the last five years, or if your taxes aren't in compliance, which you can, you can bring them into compliance before you expatriate. Um, so if any of those things are, are applicable, then you've got to pay an exit tax where basically they sell your assets on paper. So we've had clients who come to us where the first time they come to us, they have, you know, $10 million. Their business is worth $10 million. 
And so if they leave, you know, they started it for zero. That's a $10 million gain, whatever that is. That's the tax minus a small exemption. They're like, well, I can't afford that. Then they come back two years later. Now it's worth $50 million. They can't mm-hmm. afford to renounce. <laughs> yeah. Right. I have because a f- I mean, they did. I have a friend in, uh, in Canada who has a number of businesses that have grown an awful lot. And he, he literally isn't able to pay the money to leave. Yeah. Like a financial prisoner of his own financial success. Yeah. So, I mean, like Canada and other countries have an exit tax when you become a non-resident because their their tax system is residential. If you live in Canada, you pay tax on anything that you earn anywhere in the world. So like I invest in Cambodia. If I get a dividend from Cambodia and I'm a resident of Canada, Canada will tax that dividend minus whatever I paid in Cambodia, whatever. So people think, oh, that's a citizenship-based tax. No, because you can just simply leave. You don't have to go to the embassy and give up your passport. You just have to demonstrate that you've cut your ties and you've departed Canada. You can return to visit within limited you know, parameters, but you're not giving up your citizenship to leave Canada. So he is the same exit tax, just not the same requirement to give up his passport, which yeah, is what makes I mean, it more difficult. The Last year was the first year that I was fully exclusively filed in the U.S., and yep. it wasn't like the UK was coming knocking on the door. Uh, I right. mean, I'm glad I'm glad that I didn't have to go through the forms. That's the reason that you have a, an accountant that understands this stuff. But it's relatively simple. It's like, hey, I didn't spend 90 days in the United Kingdom, therefore, I I don't I I, I don't got to pay the United Kingdom any cash. But that's not the same as it is in America. In the UK, there's different different tests depending on what connections you have. It could be you know under 46, could be under 91. But yeah. Um, the days test can be difficult because I think people think like in Australia and Canada, if I spend under 183, no, 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 that's just one of the tests Mm -hmm. is how long you spend there. But what are your connections? What do you have? But yeah, they, they let you go. The UK is not one of the worst ones. Um, and, and so it, 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 it is aggressive. Is anyone else more aggressive than America? I mean, California is probably the most aggressive of all. So if you live in the U.S. and you live in California, <laughs> you're just, I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, listen, you know what frustrates me? People say there's nowhere to go because they live in a bubble. They watch their local TV news. Let's be honest, by the way. Is the propaganda in the U.S. really that much different than the propaganda anywhere else? It's, you know, they're telling you what the narrative they want you to hear. Um you know, it's people live in the bubble and they say, well, where am I going to go? Because their thoughts of where they're going to go is Canada or, or Italy or something like that. By the way, Italy has a tax incentive now. I mean, at least they realized, hey, we got to bring some money into this joint. I mean, if you can pay a flat 100,000 euros a year and you can make as much money as you want, they also have a 50 to 70 percent reduction for the first five years on taxes. So at least they've done something to bring people in. But you know what bothers me is there's nowhere to go, even in a country like Ireland. Pretty laid back. Like the immigration office, really laid back. The tax office, laid back compared to the US. You come here to Malaysia, you come to a lot of places. It is not what it is in the US. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, pay. Um, I'm a big fan of following the law, just going to where you agree with the laws. Um, you know, why why try and fight and change the laws and fight against all your fellow citizens? What you wish existed already exists somewhere. Just go there and just you'll fit in. Um, but the idea that there's nowhere to go is nonsense. Um, this the the enforcement system, just the the, the divisiveness, but just the adversarial relationship with the government. Again, speaking as a libertarian, not a huge fan of a lot of government. It's much less adversarial in some of these countries, whether it's the police, immigration, tax, these handful of Western countries. It is almost unique how adversarial they are. What should people do if they don't want to renounce their American citizenship, but they do want to try and dial their tax back? Well, if, I mean, if, again, if you're British, if you're Canadian, if you're from anywhere else, you should just find another place to live. If you are American... Uh, I didn't renounce immediately. I, 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 I remember my father read um, how the tax system worked to me. He would come home and read articles from the Wall Street Journal when I was a teenager. And I said, wait a second, if you don't live here, you don't have to pay? That's ridiculous. He's like, well, it says here you can renounce your citizenship. I'm like, maybe I'll do At 13, I'm like, maybe I'll do that. Because that seems ridiculous that they trap you like that. But nevertheless, I didn't move overseas and immediately renounce. I took advantage of dramatically lowering the taxes. So if you're an investor... 
you're at a disadvantage. So right now, you know, Bitcoin's up. And I was telling everybody, move out of your high tax country when Bitcoin was at 16,000. Now it's at 45,000 because you would have saved that whole $29,000 delta in capital gains tax. As, As an American, investment is passive. Puerto Rico's an option. That's pretty much your option if you want to lower your taxes on passive investments. But if you run a business and a business defined as not a one man or one woman show, but a business with some employees and it can function without you, you can incorporate that business in some tax haven. I think if you're an American, it probably should be a zero tax jurisdiction just so the two systems don't fight too much. What would that be like? What would be an example? Um, well, the UAE, not really anymore. That was the one people think about is Dubai. I mean, they've really come in. I had a, one of our wealthiest clients of all time message me the other night. I love the UAE, but uh, this new 9%, not a fan. Uh, Hong Kong still has a decent system. I mean, depending on the business, you know, the British Virgin Islands, there's also multiple structures. I mean, you're probably not going to be running robust payment processing in any of this. So maybe there could be a US element to your business to do things like credit cards, but maybe the parent company is going to move somewhere else. And so it depends like if the parent company, I mean, many different things, but you know, traditional tax havens, British Virgin Islands, Isle of Man, probably more difficult than it should be. Hong Kong now, um, you know, Panama is not as robust, but that's an option. Um, Belize, not so robust. Um, depends. I mean, here in Malaysia, Labuan is 3%. But uh, set up a company in probably a zero tax jurisdiction, figure out some kind of structure, depending on what your business needs, depending on how people pay you. Uh, take a salary from that company. If you're married and you both work in the business, both take a salary. Obviously, I'm not giving this is not formal tax advice. Um, but if you're married, potentially you can take out close to about 250 grand. Um, you can avoid social security and Medicare tax. And then on the rest of it, you're going to pay some lower rate of tax. And so then the question is, if you can use things like tax treaties or tax credits to pay that low rate of tax to some other country and then take it again as a credit against the US, you know, rather than moving to a zero tax country, do you move to a country where you can pay 5% tax in Europe, for example? And then you use that as an offset against the US because you were going to pay the US anyway. You might as well put some tax into Europe and then live in Europe if you want to and then work towards your passport in five years. So like these are the kinds of things that go into it. Um, if you're going to be an American these days, you're going to have to pay something if you make more than six figures. Um, and again, you know what? If you like the country and you want the option to go back and you're like, hey, for 10 years, let me pocket a boatload of cash. Uh, fine keep the U.S., pay the U.S. I- I'm not opposed to paying some tax. I'm just a guy who didn't want to live in the U.S., didn't want to be American. And so why would you not want to be something and pay for the privilege? If you like being it, pay 10%, pay 8%. I mean, that's not so bad. It's a lot better than what you're paying now. Keep the American passport. You're not going to get as good a deal as as you would as a, as a U.K. citizen, just being able to pay zero. But such is life. Um, The challenge, though, is, again, that passive income comes, are you going to sell the business for $50 million in the future? Because that's where they're going to nail you. And so that's the issue where you might want to look at, if you're only concerned about tax planning, expatriation. Because if you can argue that your business is only worth $1 million today, and you only have a $1 million in other assets, maybe you're under that $2 million threshold, and you can leave with no exit tax at all. And then once the business grows, you know, I mean, I... Again, tax was not really my motivator for leaving. It was the frustration of, I don't like the way the country's being run, and I don't really feel like I want to be part of it anyway, so why not just just expatriate? But I will say, from a financial point of view, the time when that happened was very fortuitous. My business is worth a lot more money now. If I wanted to sell it, I'm going to save a lot of millions of dollars because I I left when it was worth not really that a lot. What's the reality of this Puerto Rico hack? Well, I mean, you've actually got to live there. Um, I think it probably attracts. Per year? Two, there's different criteria, but I'm going to just call it half a year. Maybe let's call it a little bit more than half the year. I'm a more conservative guy. I mean, and I've seen some of these things people pitch, like uh, what was one of the ones last year, the Malta pension plan. That one got unraveled. And they have all these different schemes that various advisors promote, like, oh, it's so easy. You could just, you know. I'm not a fan of the, oh, it's so easy, because eventually that stuff comes crashing down. Let's say it's a little bit more than half the time in Puerto Rico to satisfy all the things. I do think it attracts the kind of person who's like, can I just get on a raft and float back to Miami? No, don't do that. Like, no, don't do that. Um, It's a place that is not that efficient. What's Um, the quality of life like? I've never been. 
I, I don't, I, I, I've been there only once. Um, I, I think people say they tolerate it. Um, and, and by <laughs> like the way, glowing, by the way, glowing people say, oh, you know, it's like people move from California to Florida in droves now. And, and they don't think anything of that. People move from New York to Texas in droves. I would argue you'd save a lot more in taxes and maybe you'd have a closer cultural connection. Okay, a lot of people from New York are in Texas now. But you might have a closer cultural connection to someone in Ireland if you're from Boston, if you're from New York, than moving to Dallas. Um, but for some reason, moving to Ireland or moving to Panama is scary. Moving to Texas, Oregon, Puerto Rico is not scary because it's in the U.S., I don't think a lot of the, the local Puerto Ricans uh, necessarily like this, uh, the system that they have going on there. I think you have some of the same issues as if you move to a foreign country. It's not that efficient. People tolerate it. I mean, the, if you want to do something at the bank, just prepare to spend all day. And so I get it. I mean, if you want to be an American or if you just like, if you just can't, if you already have tons of money, but you plan on having tons more, I get that there's certain people who want to go there. For me, the issue was, uh, I was I was single at the time when I expatriated. Um, I didn't think I would date an American, and so do you know how many people I've had where their their best tax move is to move to Puerto Rico, but they've got a Mexican girlfriend. Well, is she going to get a green card? How are you going to hang out with your Mexican girlfriend, right? Um, so I mean, that's where the dating piece comes in. Like, dude, I'll I'll, I'll take the Colombians, I'll take the Russians, like the. <laughs> Okay, I'm not not anymore, but as I'm married, but um, that for me was the problem in Puerto Rico is you're kind of limited to who you can who you can be with. What do you mean when you talk about the global citizen sandwich and the trifecta strategy? So the trifecta strategy is um, I'm I'm as I get older, I'm more focused on being in in one or two places. Uh, and then just kind of briefly visiting the others for business or checking out opportunities. Um, but for a long time, I said, I, I can't decide. I just love it all. I'm a legitimately very curious person. I'm fascinated by absolutely everything. And I would, you know, say, hey, I'd go to Mexico. I, I got to have some Mexico. I got to have some Latin America in my life. And then I'd come to Asia. Oh, I love Asia. This is great. And then I'd go to Europe. Okay, I need some of this. Okay, the trifecta is you pick three home bases. You get either a residence permit or a citizenship. Uh, theoretically, maybe you could live there as a tourist in some countries. And you basically have three home bases and you split your time between them. Now you can modify it. But I mean, the, the pure trifecta, as I called it, was four months in one, four months in another, and four months in a third. So it might be, you know, from December through March, I'm going to be in Kuala Lumpur where it's warm. Then April, May, June, July, I'm going to go somewhere in, in Europe. And then, you know, the rest of the year, I'm going to be in Latin America. And I want to experience everything the world has to offer. There's different business lessons you learn from being in, being in different places. There's different cultures. Um, I mean, Asian culture is substantially different in some ways to what you might be used to in the UK and in the US. And so some people, 12 months a year, they're going to burn out. A lot of people come to Asia. They do the two-year thing. That's why they call them expats. It's not permanent. They're not immigrants, right? They don't plan on staying. I think if you spent four months a year in Asia in the best months, you would love coming back. Um, and so that was the trifecta. And it just so happens that in the kind of countries that I tend to like, that can be very tax friendly. And in some cases, it's just like, hey, you didn't spend six months in Colombia, so you don't owe us any tax. The goal was not tax avoidance. That was the side effect. And so I'm in the tax business right? People don't come to me to talk about how they don't like their mother or they want to dance salsa. They come because they have a problem paying too much tax. And so I prescribed it as, I like it for the lifestyle. You might like it for the tax. The global citizen sandwich is exactly why I'm in Malaysia. Malaysia is Kuala Lumpur. I'm not saying it's the absolute best place. It is the best value place in the, in the, in the world to live. Nicest people. It's humid, but otherwise good weather. Tons of consumer conveniences. I went to a five-star hotel where we have our Nomad Countless Live event uh, last year. They have a beautiful gentleman's club, like a smoke, like a cigar lounge. Got four cocktails at happy hour, served by a guy in a white dinner jacket who knows everybody who's successful in the country. And four cocktails cost me 23 bucks. Uh, the most beautiful ambiance. You wear a smoking jacket. They come and they can get a haircut. I mean, there's nowhere better. 
you obviously wouldn't pay that in Singapore. But I, I, I do trust Singapore more than if I have precious metals to store or I want to put $10 million in a bank. I'd rather do it there. I do think Malaysian banks are pretty darn safe, but I'm not putting my $10 million. They just don't have as many options. They don't have as many investment options, as many currencies. It's harder to get the money out. So I'm going to Singapore next door. That's the top layer of the bread. That's like the creme de la creme. The meaty part, the meat in the middle is where you live, Malaysia. And then the other layer of bread is, okay, I own a home in Malaysia. The trade-off is it's not really increasing in value. There's, there's a good amount of supply. It'll take 10 or 15 years for me to see much appreciation. I li- my investment is a lifestyle investment. And so you know, I'm the, one of the largest investors in a fund that a friend of mine runs in Cambodia. I think Cambodian real estate has some of the highest promise for capital appreciation in the next five to 10 years of any market in Southeast Asia, and it's accessible. And so I wouldn't live in Cambodia. I wouldn't bank, you know, $10 million in Cambodia. I don't think I need to live in Singapore. So the nice meaty part in the middle is where you spend your actual life living. And then the layers on top are the, the, the extremes of the asset protection and then the more adventurous kind of capital appreciation. Can't you buy- And you can, you, you can do that anywhere. You can buy land in Cambodia as a non-citizen, non-resident, is that right? No, there's like four countries in Asia. Thailand was was promising to open it up, and I think they scrapped it um, for for high investors. Uh, Malaysia, Japan, parts of Korea, uh, I forget the other one. Uh, But Malaysia is actually the most open in Southeast Asia. You can own land. So you can actually buy land. You can build a house. I have a friend who's doing that. Uh, In Cambodia, you cannot, but you can own condo buildings. Now, uh, you know, there's a program, you know, if uh, if you donate money to a charity endorsed by the king, the king will give you citizenship. Then you can go out as a newly minted Cambodian citizen and buy what you want. But um, you can also set up a Cambodian company and, and, and you can do that. So, you know, what my friend did was he set up the Cambodian company, pulled everybody together because it's not really cost efficient to do it to buy one apartment. Um, but generally in Asia, you're not going to get citizenship. And outside of like Malaysia, you're going to buy a condominium, condominium. That's how it works. But they're very tax friendly places. They're very laid back, very laissez-faire. People come to Kuala Lumpur, they think, oh, it's a Muslim country. And everyone who comes here, the most progressive people I know, they say, everyone told me we don't care. Especially if you're not, if you're not Malay Muslim, I mean, if you're Malay Muslim, okay, they're going to they're gonna judge you a little bit. Even if you're Malaysian, but you're not Muslim, you can wear the shortest shorts, you can wear the tiniest tops. You can do what you can drink. You can do whatever you want. We don't judge you. That's like that's between you and your God. We don't judge you. So it's this very laid back place. Um, and, I, and I'm a big fan. Talking about Muslim countries that are both Muslim and not, Dubai being British, that is the uh, probably the most common uh, after somewhere like a, a season in Ibiza for the summer yeah. or, or Magaluf or Zanti or somewhere like that. A uh, lot of people going to Dubai. A lot of my close friends uh, going and living out there. There was a period, uh, some of my friends have been going out for literally 10 years. There was a period a while ago where, did you have to get, you had to know an Emirati or something? And and if you knew someone who was Emirati, you could kind of get this extra blessing. And then there was this other period for a brief while, maybe five years ago, up until five or four or five years ago, where you had to go and do like a visa run once every quarter or something and now it's a little bit easier and it, it, it continues to be doing that but what's the mm-hmm. give me the the thoughts on dubai because from a, a british person's yeah. perspective it's the it's nomad capitalist encapsulated in a single country again i'm a bit of a contrarian right i mean i and i think i almost like Kuala Lumpur. i think it is the best value but i almost like it in a sense because it's not bangkok a lot of people go to bangkok i just kind of like to do my own thing um so we had our company in Dubai for a while, and we decided to move out. Um, the banking, I think, is quite difficult. I'm, the quality of private banking is it, it's not ready. It's just not. Uh, and I just had that experience as recently as two months ago. Um, I've got to go and figure out, you know, what, 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 what where, you know, <laughs> what's happening with some money that I sent them because the, the quality of service in the banking system not impressed. Um, if you want to run a business, I think it's much, It's really designed to for people who want to live there so our finance team is in tbilisi georgia um and every time we wanted to do something they're like well 
just coming to the branch. It's like the US. They're like, well, people live outside of the US? What, what are you talking about? Like people live outside of Dubai? Like we can't imagine that. Like Because people who live there, who work in banks and stuff, their dream was to live in Dubai. How, how can you not live in Dubai? That's impossible. It's not really set up for remote operations. So, um, and now the free, I mean, and now they're bringing in this 9% tax and they're applying it more aggressively to even the free zone companies than can was you originally explain thought. the 9% tax? I haven't heard of this. So, well, there's this global minimum tax that they brought in on big companies. So if you have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, the world got together and said, we can't have you moving all your profits to, you know, Bermuda. Let's apply some global tax that applies across the board, not to businesses like yours and mine. Well, I don't know, maybe you're making hundreds of millions, but not mine. Um, and so they basically said, okay, everybody's going to raise their rates. So a country like Ireland, for example, said, okay, we're 12 and a half. If you meet the threshold, we'll bump it up to 15. But what also happened was some of these countries that wanted to kind of get along were like, okay, well, we'll increase our tax rates just on everybody. Um, and the UAE did that. So they said, okay, it's going to be 9% if you run an onshore business. But if you're in the free zones, which is where a lot of people would set up, you know, there's different free zones in, in Dubai and all over the country, as long as you're not working with other UAE, you know, entities, okay, and it's like, you know, you're not going to pay, it's still going to be zero. I said, okay, that's kind of like Hong Kong. If you're based in Hong Kong, you pay tax. If you're offshore, there's a way you can exempt yourself and not pay any tax. Okay, fine. Fair enough. Well, then they started creeping in more and more and more into the free zones to where now it's like most people running a business are going to pay 9%. Even like we looked at into, can we just keep our, our trademarks there? No, you have to do transfer pricing. You've got to move money into the UAE from your other companies to pay for the value of the trademarks that you're using. And then we're going to tax that at 9%. So the UAE basically rolled out a 9% tax on domestic companies. And then it's kind of been creeping into the companies that don't have any connection to Dubai. They just said, hey, it's 0% tax. What a nice place to go. I can get a bank account. I can get a residence permit. I give the UAE incredible credit for making the residence process that you mentioned incredibly easy. It is one of the easiest in the world. And if you want to personally live there, They've said for now it's going to be 0% tax on your personal. So if you would just have, again, stock earnings or something, well, actually stocks, if you have dividends, could be a problem. But if you just have capital gains, if you have you know Bitcoin, whatever, fine. But if you're going to run a business that's based in the UAE, I, I don't think it's that ideal. But I give them incredible uh, respect for how they've made immigration super easy. And it just proves the point. If you run your country to where you don't have a big social welfare system, you don't let people get away with crimes. Why wouldn't you let anyone who sets up a company, anyone who invests some money, why wouldn't you let them come and be a resident? I mean, that's the way the U.S. used to be. And so I see in that point, like it's kind of like the new American dream. Anyone who wants to make something of themselves, come on in. We're not going to make it hard. And they don't. But I think on the tax side, um, in an effort to placate uh, the global powers, they got a little bit more aggressive than they initially thought. And it's not the government's fault that the banks are difficult, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm not impressed by the banks. I mean, we are talking about a country that changed the weekend only a couple yeah. of years ago. And just for yeah. the people that, people that don't know, the Dubai weekend used to be Friday, Saturday. So your Friday night would have been a Thursday night and you went back to work yeah. on a Sunday morning. And <laughs> one day, one day everyone just woke up and the government said, hey, guess what? The weekend is Saturday and Sunday now. Um, All the British, like, yeah, I mean, are you going to kind of like, I'm working on Sunday? Like, what the hell's that? Listen, I, and I think, I mean, Saudi Arabia is kind of doing this now as well. I mean, Bahrain was always one of the more liberal ones. Um, I mean, I think the whole Gulf, with the UAE being the kind of the biggest standout, has done an incredible job at what I would call, let's go out and figure out, basically, go where you're treated best. Hey, who's doing this the best? Okay, let's let's just implement that. Okay, what what do they got going on? Okay, that oh, that makes but sense. From let's a do policy that. perspective, yeah, how interesting. It's it's right. I mean, you know, you know what the here's how I can assess whether a country's a failure. And and I know this because I, I we have people who work in some of these countries, and that's why it was more affordable for us to go there. I don't know. That's not how we do it. We do it this way. Well, maybe the results suck, and you should change how you do it. But your pride gets in the way. I have a great respect for the UAE and these other countries. I mean, they have a pride for their country, but it's not the pride doesn't get in the way of let's make the right decisions. Yeah. And they've done the, an incredible job on that. Uh, how would you say like 
philosophically non-monogamous when it comes to their procedures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, um, I, I, I think yeah, I think non-monogamy in in the context of choosing countries and policies and things it makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I've had in my head as you've been talking through all of this today is, dear God, how much paperwork is associated with all of this? You're talking about, I mean, dude, I had to submit, and I'm aware I tried to get into a very difficult country to get into, but I had to submit a a three inch thick, seven hundred page hard copy portfolio for my 01 oh, wow. and uh, you know to get a social security number and there's no license equivalency test america has the worst hey guess what america you can't drive no one can drive in america right no one everybody's a bad driver there's no license equivalency between the uk and the us so i need to retake right. my theory test in order to be able to get a driver's license in order to be able to get a car but before i did that i had to get a social security number and in order to get a social security number i had to show my i94 but your i94 is only triggered if you've entered the country through the border within the last three months which meant that i had to leave to go to the bahamas to come back just to trigger this arbitrary number so my point being i've had to deal with lots of paperwork and i essentially live in two country all right i, I, I i'm invested in some form or a stakeholder in two different countries and you're this like big long octopus with his tentacles wrapped around many countries like how does how would anybody get even begin to get this started without just drowning in tons of correspondence well i, I was at a bank not so long ago um in serbia and i think the banks are safe there i think it's a nice kind of diversification play but it was never a place i wanted to put a lot of money and so when I said, okay, let me, let me get a new debit card just in case I need it. I'm, I'm never going to need it, but just in case I carry around like this many debit cards. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I went to pick it up and they're like, oh, do you have a Dina card? I'm like, yeah, I guess it expired. They, they, so they're required by law to give you this card that you can make payments in Serbian dinars. Like nobody uses it, but they're required for you to give you one. And they're like, oh, we've got to cut up your debit card and we, you've got to come back in a month. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not here. I, I'm here like once or twice a year. I'm not coming back. So you know what? Go where you're treated best. I'm just not going to have a debit card and I'll keep a little, little bit less money in that account. And, um, you know, that's what it is. Uh, I'm probably going to sell some land I own next door in Montenegro. Just the thought of, oh my God, I got to build a villa. You know what? Someone's probably built a villa somewhere else and I can just buy it if I want to. And you know what? Maybe I should just rent a villa for a while and just like put the money to work. Um, so I think that you've got to, you know, that's kind of the whole thought process behind what we're doing is like, you don't have to go to the US because yeah, I had some properties that I owned in the US and it was the most laborious process. Now, the US real estate market does have more liquidity than some other markets, but where I own these properties, it wasn't that great. And I sold them and there were just so many fees and so many things to do. And just like, I, I mean, I think like the grass was literally half an inch too long and I got a thing in the mail like, violation. And they're like, they just want you to pay a hundred bucks. That doesn't really exist in all the other countries. I just went through, I, I go through end of the year. I pay all the bills for seven properties. I have one of the people on my finance team help me. And it's pretty, pretty darn easy. And I have people who have helped me. It's and in many cases, in many countries, it's more informal. Someone was your real estate agent. Three years later, if you want their help with the air conditioning, that hey, I'll just go over there and check it out. Um, you pay them a few bucks. So I, I, I found that, yes, there's bureaucracy. Um, I mean, having if you grow the business large enough, you just build an in-house team that specializes in it. We do it in-house. But, I mean, the same with, the, the, with Dubai. It just became too much to manage. Uh, you know, and we just said, you know what, we're just going to go back where we were. Um, so it is go where you're treated best. And I think that, again, the U.S. is an ex – that's an extreme outlier. Um, I, I saw a statistic not long ago that if you're getting a green card interview for, I forget if it's like a sibling or what kind of family member you're trying to come as through family reunification uh, from certain countries like India, Mexico, China, you applied in 1998. That's when you filed. That's when you, that's when you did all the paperwork to get approved you're now coming in to finalize the process in 2020. Well, it was 2023 then. Um, now, whatever you think about family reunification, I mean, we do that for people all the time. You know, someone gets a Portugal residence permit, then they add their wife through family reunification. It takes, you know, a month or two or something. Um, 
there's something, I mean, the US system is broken. And again, even in Ireland, just got someone a, uh, a work permit the other day so they can go and work there and they can work for their own company. And it's kind of a tax efficient way for them to, to live in the country. Uh, it took like a month and a half. The person made a small mistake. The solicitor pointed it out. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, said the government officer. Uh, that doesn't happen in the U. I mean, the U.S. is an outlier. It's very uh, adversarial, very cantankerous. It really is. I mean, I, I mean, and, and uh, you had the best situation. I mean, go into a U.S. embassy in, and I've been there in Georgia, for example, you know, and it just watch the visa interviews there. I mean, Dude, British I to, is like, I, that's I, a nice no, touch. No, no. I went to Guatemala. Yeah. I went to the yeah. the embassy there because the wait time, I was 88 days into a 90-day Esther about to go over. And if I had, I would have been immediately banned from the country for God knows right. how many years. So I was like, right, well, I'll leave. Go to, oh God, uh, I had the choice between El Salvador, Belize, and Guatemala. And I was like, right, well, let's go to Guatemala. So I go to Guatemala. I'm able to get, you know, Berlin, 2024. This is 2022. It's taken ages because there was this backlog from COVID for people getting a one application, blah, blah, blah. London, 2024. Uh, Guatemala, next week. I'm like, hey, guess I'm going to Guatemala. Right. Um, so th that was, I guess that was a little bit sort of nomad. nomad I, I mean, you're, you're still British. I mean, I, right, so I think you, you kind of stand out as the shining, you know, uh, it, it's like, oh, finally somebody I, you know, like. Um, An ex-colonist. Yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think if you're British or Irish, I mean, getting an L1 is is more straightforward. Um, but no, it's it's you know, I, people say, oh, you 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 hate the U.S. I just don't think they're best at anything. I guess prisoner population <laughs> uh, per capita, um, they're not they're not even best at obesity anymore. <laughs> uh, so I mean, like, I just want to go where things are best. And um, I, I, I would if if people take nothing away from this, I I just I never felt good in the U.S. again for multiple different reasons. But like when I started traveling, you know, the TSA they open up your stuff, they're yelling. At, I mean, just like just so many interactions with the government are unpleasant. That when you go to so many other countries, it, it's you think, oh, it must be the same. It's it's not the same. It really isn't. Uh, that's it's just not the norm. Let's say that there's someone who's listening to this, uh, maybe two people, one of them's American and one of them isn't. And they're thinking, uh, Andrew made a bit of sense there. I, I don't feel a massive amount of affinity. I feel like I could do with a change, uh, but I don't really know where to start and going to somewhere to simply be a tourist. Like I need to, perhaps I need to work in some regard. Where would you, like you mentioned that Dubai is, is very simple. What are some of the other places that's like on the, um, the new Passport Bro starter kit, Who's what, what's included in that? Well, so, I mean, my focus, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, and I realized, you know, as maybe 20 years old, I had a Vonage phone. If anybody remembers Vonage, like a VoIP phone. And I would, I would basically, you know, cold call people for my business. I would call businesses. Uh, hey, do you want to buy some advertising? And I, I, re I realized pretty early on, why couldn't I do this from anywhere? And eventually I started to do as I was, as I was traveling. Uh, I resisted the urge to move fully, but I, there were some years I traveled more than half the year and I'd be in China and nobody would even know. I would literally call my clients that, you know, they wouldn't know the difference. Um, and you know, I, I think that's the perspective I come from is you have something that you can take with you. So first I would develop that. Um, is it, you know, I'm a, I'm a cryptocurrency trader. I'm a stock investor. I have an online Graphic business, designer. I'm a consultant, yeah, I'm freelancer, whatever I can take with me. The cool thing about the US is there is more flexibility, again, not tax advice, but there's more flexibility, generally speaking, on keeping your US bank accounts. And so, you know, whereas if you leave the UK or Canada, like, there's, they're more like, you should probably close that. Um, I would get that in line first. Now, I think, you know, Kuala Lumpur versus like New York was like 25 cents on the dollar. I mean, I just, you know, four cocktails, 23 bucks. That's like what, one cocktail in Las Vegas or something. Um, you don't have to make as much, but I would get to the point where I can, I can support myself. Um, I mean, Dubai does have a lot of networking opportunities, um, depending on what you do. Um, I think, I mean, it depends on your personality. I think a place like in Ireland where they speak English where it's very open, 
I would say the UK, but the UK has no way to move there. Uh, we had Nigel oh, so. Farage at Nomad. We, well, we had Nigel Farage at Nomad Capitalist Live a couple of years ago. I told him like, you got rid of the investor visa. The startup visa doesn't really work. It, even if even when it rarely does work, it's like you have to be the next Facebook or you have to be investing in the next Facebook. Like, there's just no way for a person with wealth or a business to move to the UK. Generally, it's just really just not a process for that. Um, you can get a job and move to the UK. You can get married and move to the UK. But like a guy like me cannot easily move to the UK. So to me, that's kind of a bulwark. Um, you know, I like a place like in Ireland. Somebody else might like a place like a Switzerland that has maybe more established. I don't know what you want to call it. I mean, Dubai obviously has a lot of very new money. What about Portugal? Um, so what- I saw Portugal were advertising for a while. Come and live in Lisbon. It's on GMT. We'll give you a visa yeah. that's simple and so on. Is that not simple to get to? They are, but they got rid of the they got rid of the tax program. They had a great tax incentive. Mm-hmm. Um, it was for crypto so, bros, right? They were looking to try and bring people in that were trading crypto. I, okay, for crypto, yeah. I, I, I've, I, unfortunately, I've, I've lost some confidence in Portugal. Um, not a bad place to live. Um, uh, for me, you know, the places that I, I've mentioned today, you know, Malaysia and Ireland, people complain in both cases for opposite reasons about the weather. To me, the weather is the least important thing. If you can't handle some humidity. Turn on the air conditioning. You know, in Ireland and Dublin, it doesn't rain that much. Um, so I think the use case for Portugal is like, oh, the weather is so nice. I, I've never entirely understood that one. Um, so some of their incentives have gone away. Uh, I mean, th- the answer is there's something for everybody. Um, I mean, I think Mexico is an interesting place. A lot of people is that have gone simple? there. Is Mexico simple to be able to spend a, a three month, six month? I'm going to go and do my graphic design from there. Well, r- so. I'm a big fan of having a residence permit, especially now. So Mexico technically is like the UK. You get 180 days visa free. But much like the UK, they're not doing it anymore. Hey, when are you leaving? Oh, I'm just here for the six months. Yeah, we don't accept that. Get, get the hell out. Or I'll give you one month and then you need to leave. Um, if you can get a Mexican residence, which is pretty easy. I mean, everything's easy. Nothing is easy. But it's the qualifications are straightforward enough. You have a couple thousand in income every month. Um, you can get a residence permit, live there all you want. Obviously, if you live there too long, there's a tax planning question. But yes, I mean, Mexico is a straightforward place. Latin America is a place where if you have income, you can get a residence permit. Asia is generally a place where you need to have wealth, put some money in our bank, buy a property, you know, put in six figures. Latin America is the place where if you're just starting out, um, hey, show us $800, $1,000, $1,200, $2,000 a month in income for the last three, six months, 12 months, whatever. Here's your residence permit. You can live here all you want. So, um, I mean, I think Colombia is interesting. People live in Medellin. I'm in Bogota. I think all of Mexico is interesting. I mean, Mexico City in particular for me, but there's so many cities I mean, to pick. Portugal is interesting. They got rid of the tax incentive. Italy has a very interesting tax incentive. People like that. Um, you know, it just depends on what you want. I mean, I, I, I think we popularized the country of Georgia. Very tax friendly, not as affordable anymore with Where all the Russians that are coming. Uh, east of Turkey, south of Russia. Okay. In the Caucasus. Right, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now, you know, what's Georgia, the, Armenia. What's the culture like in, in Georgia? Uh, decreasingly conservative. <laughs> Coming into land. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very kind of conservative, respectful culture, laid back. So like Armenia next door, they were always the ones who, you know, there's, there's like 40,000 Armenians in Uruguay. I went there and I saw Armenian restaurants. Georgians were always more like chill, enjoy, great food, great wine, great hospitality. If you know a Georgian, you've got like a friend for life. Um, so in that regard, it's nice. The culture is a little bit different. Um, you know, I've enjoyed it, but I also see why some people could get, could get stuck up on that. Uh, I mean, there's just so many places. And then there's Southeast Asia. I mean, Malaysia, Thailand. Um, but that's, those so are a little places. bit more restricted to wealth and presumably a little bit more procedural. You can get digital nomad visas. Thailand has the Thai elite visa. You pay a fee every five years. Um, so there are more affordable ways to do it if your goal is not permanence. You can also come to Malaysia for 90 days on a tourist visa. And I would guess if you left for a couple of weeks and came back, uh, they'd give you another 90 days if you're a Westerner. Um, you know, if you're not a Westerner, it's 30 days and that becomes harder to navigate. But if you can make $2,000 a month, I think it is, you can get a digital, digital nomad visa. That may not last forever. But the question is, you know, what's your level of commitment to this? For me, when I left the U.S., I said, 
I lied to myself. I'm going to do this for a year. I knew I wasn't coming back. It was just, hey, keep the house. Don't sell the house. Um, but I always knew it was, it was it was done. I think for some people, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to have a five-year adventure. I'm going to learn how the world works. I'm going to pick up some new ideas. I'm going to learn, hey, they do it over here. Same as we talked about in the UAE. Hey, here's how they do this over here. If I added that, I bet that would make my business better. I'm going to save some taxes for five years. I'm going to bring that money back and then just, you know, enjoy my life. I don't think you have to do that. I mean, I've talked about, you know, having kids. I could have kids and live in multiple places. You can hire a tutor. Um, there's any number of things you can do. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a question. Let's say that somebody does have yeah. kids. What's, what's a, a solution that you look at uh, for your clients? Presumably a tutor that you would need to pay that would have to fly and be prepared to move with you? Well, I mean, some people just move to one place. They move and they put their kids in international school. We've got a, a, a private client right now. He's like, I want to move to Thailand. And uh, I'm buying in the same complex as the school. And um, I mean, that there's something to be said for that. Um, you could, you know, there's international schools, a lot of places you could homeschool in a lot of places. I mean, some of the Northern European countries are pretty nasty on that, but most of the rest of the world is not. Um, but if you don't want to homeschool yourself, so I know, I know a family, we've got a guy who's speaking at, at our uh, live event coming up uh, this year named Joshua Sheets, and he's a family of four and they homeschool them and they travel around and they do it themselves. I also met a very successful guy in the entertainment business who is doing kind of my trifecta. He's like, I heard you say trifecta. And it's like, that's kind of what I'm doing. And he has the homes around the world and uh, they hired a tutor that travels with them. So there's different ways to do it. So but my, my point is, I don't think that like, this has to be a single person's game or a couple's game. I think you can keep doing it. If you decide to do it for five years and to get the experience and to save the money, um, maybe to get an extra passport in the process if you settle down in one place, I think that's fine too. Uh, it's always good to have more options, have more knowledge. But the idea that you have to give it up because now it's time to settle down. Um, I mean, I, I, mean I, I talked to my friend. I said, bring your son. Your son's like 17. Come over and visit me in Asia. Bring him for two weeks. Take him out of school. He'll learn more hanging around in Asia for two weeks than whatever they're teaching in the Chicago school system. Okay? I mean, believe me. So, I, you know, we have this bias that whatever happens in our country somehow works. Now, we complain about our country. Biden has sold us down the river. Trump is turning us into a fascist hellhole, whatever, right? We complain about it, but somehow it's still the best in the world. And that's not just Americans. Everyone says, a lot of people say that. And it's like, well, wait a second. Again, what's best about it? Is your education system the best? I, who was it the other day? It wasn't Guatemala, but it was something similar is now outpacing the U.S. in, like, math literacy. literacy or some shit. Like, not, 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 not Korea or something you've heard of, but, like, you know, it's, like, El Salvador or something. Like, they're, they're better now. And, and, and so, like, you, well, you I think, can't you know, have kids? I, I have a, a non-zero uh, cohort of friends who are around about my age, mid-30s, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to, you know, kids, kids are probably going to come along at some point. Maybe they've got a partner or maybe they're looking or maybe they're engaged or married or whatever. And they're staring down the barrel of the U.S. education system with trepidation. And they're thinking, like, I don't know. If I put a child in, I don't know what's going to come out the other side. And, you know, look at how many different people are trying to innovate their way away from this. It's Waldorf schools or it's like um, there's one here uh, that's run Apogee Park that's run by Tim Kennedy. And it's like all of this stuff sounds great, but... I, I, like all of these things are largely unproven. Now that may be better than something that's proven to also be completely crazy or useless. But like, do I do I want my kid to learn how to whittle a flute out of a fucking stick? Like, am I going to teach him how to hoe hoe the ground? Like, so the U.S. You're totally correct. Like, I, we have I, these things. Education. I had a friend. Want. I had a friend who moved to Dubai, and he had a salary, like a million dollar salary. So he was screwed as an American. Because if you just have a salary, you just get a small exemption, you pay on the rest. But he at least was still paying less than when he lived in New York City. And he told me when I had three kids, I had to earn $400,000 pre-tax to send him to school. I said, imagine for 13 years, you put $400,000 into some fund for those kids. And you had them live in Dubai. They'd learn another language. They'd learn international. They would do you know something else. You're telling me the extra money 
and not being in New York and being some international wouldn't be far better for them. Here's what else I think about it. One of the concerns that some of our clients have and some of my old friends in the U.S. have is not just the low quality of education in the U.S., but, oh, they're teaching, you know, there's this whole social conversation. They're teaching woke. They're teaching this. They're teaching that. And people sometimes get upset with me that I'm not so angry about this. And I say, I'm not angry about it because I don't even know what it is really, honestly. People aren't talking about that stuff where I live. And I don't have to be a part of it. I think that what makes people angry is powerlessness. And so we convince ourselves to stay in the bubble based on where we're born because that's the best. That's what we're told. And we're fed the propaganda. But then we gain this sense of powerlessness because we don't like the way things are being done. And we get angry about it. We become miserable because we don't think there's another option. I have plenty of options because I've decided to have options. And so therefore, I don't just sit around like I don't have to bother myself. Like if I don't want to do something or if I don't want my kids to learn something, whatever that may be, that's, we're not going to do it. There's a, there's a solution to that. I don't have to feel powerless and carry this anger around with me. And I certainly don't have to think that I have to base my entire life on one politician getting elected and they're going to solve all my problems. I'd heard, I, I think I'd even heard you speak about some people that have traveled abroad when the wife is pregnant to give birth in another country. How common is that as a, a nomadic strategy? Well, I mean, I think it's much more common for uh, people to come to the U.S. and Canada and do that because you know most countries in the Americas have this birthright citizenship. If you're born on the soil, you're given citizenship. Uh, I actually know somebody from Armenia. I do not encourage them to do this. I wasn't even aware of it. They got a U.S. visa. She and her husband. She came over and gave birth. Now she has an American child. Um, that Which child cannot that, sponsor that, her. I was going to say, does that work upward for the parents? I think the child has to be an adult, and then they can bring you. Uh, and so that's a faster one. That's I don't. I don't think you're waiting 25 years for that one, but you might wait five years. years or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Well, you're going to wait the 18. Right. But the child always has the opportunities. Um, they also have now this lifetime citizenship. So it's like, really, this person is, watches my stuff and they, they didn't think of that. But the reverse, I mean, so this, um, the, the, the uh, you know, Joshua Sheets, they gave birth to one of their children in Costa Rica. And so now they all got residence permits in Costa Rica and the child's a Costa Rican citizen. Um, I think that's great because especially if you're like an American, Costa Rica is a nice antidote. Who hates the Costa Ricans? Imagine you want to travel. Okay, Costa Ricans need a visa to go to the U.S. Well, if you're a U.S. citizen, you're going to go with your U.S. pass. We're required to. Um, Costa Ricans can pretty much go to most of the rest of the world. You know, Canada, Australia, they can't go. Those are kind of the, the toughest ones. But they can go to the U.K. They can go to all of Europe. I mean, Costa Ricans are pretty well accepted all around the world. So are El Salvador. So are Guatemalans. I mean, those are pretty good passports, actually. You wouldn't think that the people you see, you, the entire story of that region is not so much Costa Rica. People are all trying to come to the U.S. for more wealth. But if you have wealth, you have plenty of options in Central America. And so um, I think it's an increasing strategy. Brazil is one people go to. Mexico is one. Um, sometimes you can get citizenship faster. In Brazil, it's one year if you've got a child or a spouse. Now you've got to wait like an extra year to be processed. You probably should live there for a part of that two years. But... Um, it's in some cases a strategy for you to get a residence or even citizenship in the country. But if nothing else, you're just giving your child an extra. And I mean, when I when I met my wife, this is one of the things that's like, would you be willing to go go to Brazil? So, all right, that, that sounds reasonable. I'm like, that seems like a pretty open minded person. Um, you know, again, I, I. I had a friend who told me, you know what, you, you know what your superpower is, is you don't have this nostalgia about things that cause you to put up barriers. Oh, we used to all go to the Portillo's for, you know, after high school. Like you don't you don't get into that. And so my question is, it's very entrepreneurial, I think. I want to give birth I want to have, you know, my mother of my child give birth in Brazil, for example. Uh, what do I need to solve for? I need to buy a few flight tickets so that, you know, family members can come because that's what people want. Okay, we want our family there. Um I need to, you know, maybe you've got to go there X number of months early for certain kind of, you know, appointments throughout the pregnancy, you know, like that's what you have to solve for. And the payoff is you now have a child who has a passport that potentially there's a domestic economy. I think Mexico is, is I mean, look at the peso. 
it's done incredibly. I was on CBS a couple of weeks ago talking about the pay. It's incredible against the U.S. dollar. Mexico is moving in the right direction. I think you're you're potentially giving them a passport in some of those countries. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. If nothing else, it gives them an opportunity to travel, gives them more places to live. I mean, just you're just giving them a whole world of opportunities. You mentioned there about living in a place before you perhaps move there. In your experience, are there any locations that are fun to go on holiday and might seem romantic or seductive as an idea, but the reality of living there for one reason or another is not what the holiday promised? I was thinking the other day about Vienna, because uh, I love Vienna, and um, now Austria has no tax program. Again, my goal is, I, my goal is, people confuse this, I'm happy to pay some level of tax. We can argue whether tax is fair or not fair. My goal is not to always pay zero. If it happens that I pay zero, great. If I pay a little bit, great. I don't think any country is worth, if you're a successful person, 40 or 50%. Oh, you get free health care. Well, that's great. You made 10 million, you paid 5 million. You could have bought your own health care. Um, but I think that the challenge with some of those places that people like, I mean, my father loves Germany. Um, he just likes the vibe. Um, it's harder to meet friends there. I really look Language at optimizing. Um, closed. I mean, I remember flying back from Vienna 14 years ago. I sat next to a guy, American guy, married to an Austrian woman. He said, it's just, it's just a harder place to make friends. Now, I think once you make friends in some of those places, it's, they're better friends than you'd have like in LA. I mean, it's more serious friends. But I would say the same thing about Georgia, for example. I mean, I have always been helped whenever I need something. And it didn't take me that long to integrate. They're just open people. So, I, listen, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I love Austria. Um... But I think that you know maybe some of those Central European places that a certain kind of person like myself who doesn't like the Southern European laid back beach vibe, they think, oh, Austria. I love Vienna, but I think you're going to have a harder time making friends in a place like that. And I, no, I don't think it's the language barrier. Uh, I can get by in Spanish. My Spanish isn't fluent enough, and I'm certainly not fast enough to to engage in the long conversations that the barista in Bogota wants to have with me. If I solved for that, I could have tons of friends in, in Bogota. Um, so that's that's an issue. The language barrier, I don't think in, East, in, in Central Europe it is. Um, you know, I think there's places in Eastern Europe that are very direct. I appreciate certain directness over time. The directness turns into brusqueness in some cases. Um, obviously, and I'm just, I'm not a big fan of resort destinations. I mean, I, I think people should, you know, I don't understand the thing of, living in a vacation, like living on a Caribbean island, but to each their own. Somebody might like that. Uh, I'm not a laid back person, but I think that you want to optimize for where can I make friends easily? And some of the happiest people that I know who are expats or even immigrants in very far flung cultures, none of their friends are expats. I've got a friend who lives in Thailand. All of his friends are Thai mm -hmm. and they're educated. They speak English. He speaks some Thai, but they kind of accommodated him in English. But he thinks like a Thai person with some American attributes, but he really kind of has the whole kind of Thai approach. Um, and he's stuck with it for that reason. So I think that you, you want to maybe have some local friends. And if you have a hard time doing that, I think that's probably a place that's more difficult. How many of the clients that you're working with and the people that you come into contact with are doing the nomad thing as a protection strategy, kind of like being a, a I guess, a global prepper in some regard. Yeah. Um, how, how is that? Is that on the rise? What are you noticing with trends yeah. with regards to that? It's, a, it's an increasing number. I mean, there's, there's, there's always waves, right? So I think we're going to see that again this year with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as those go up. Um, it just as we saw in 2021, COVID, I think, was a big wake up call for people. Um, and we can debate, you know, I'm sure there are some people who have views that are more extreme than mine, but I mean, governments around the world were pretty restrictive and it showed that citizenship really is an obligation. I mean, if you were Australian, you couldn't leave and you couldn't return and look at how many people in Australia said, well, yeah, it's your fault. You took a holiday to Mauritius. Like, what about the rest of us? Like this whole kind of greater good. 
the individualism of you're a citizen, you've got a right to return to your own country. That's literally like international law, like the United Nations. This is not like some right wing concept um, was just thrown out the window. And so I think people realized in what people thought were these great infallible countries like, oh, my country can screw me. Um, they don't really care about me. I've been paying all these years and maybe I haven't even complained about paying. And now when I need support, I'm hung out to dry. And so I think you're seeing more people saying, yeah, I want a backup plan. Um, whether that's about, you know, people want health freedom. We have people uh, from the U.S. that when Roe v. Wade was overturned, they said, I don't want to live in a country where abortion is not legal. What people don't understand about me and my brand, I, I don't judge. I mean, to me, that's, that's the international political views that I've kind of picked up. The Again, the Dubai approach of let's just have the best like what works if you want to live in a country where there's legal abortion i'm not going to judge you for that um if you want to live in a place where there's less of a vaccine mandate i'm not going to judge you for that um i might agree with some of those positions and i might agree in part or i might not agree at all but like i think people are realizing that again like where they're born doesn't mean it's always going to align with their values i think a lot of these countries are changing and so, yes, more people are looking for a plan B. There's a fine line between kind of forcing people to do what you've done, which they may not be comfortable with, and trying to open their mind to the idea that you can leave. Uh, again, I'll tell you what we get a lot. Uh, I want to leave in five years when the kids all graduate. I mean, could the kids not go to school somewhere else? Would that maybe not be better for them? I don't have kids in high school, so it's not for me to judge. I, I think more people should have a plan A, not just because they can save money on taxes, but because I think you learn a lot. I think it changes you in very positive ways to live other places. And I think that people don't move because of this sense of fear. Again, they're happy to move to Florida, not happy to move an equal distance to some other country. Um, but a lot of people want plan B, citizenship residents sometimes they want plan b c d e um so yeah not everyone that we work with now is moving whereas when we started it was i want to move i'm tired of paying tax now there's a lot of i don't want to move or i'll move later or maybe i'll you know get a residence permit and spend three months there in the winter uh one of the guys that i talked to very kind of a wealthy guy didn't realize as an american he just can't go to italy and spend four months yeah, you can't. It's 90 days out of every 180. You need to get a residence permit. You need to get some kind of citizenship. So it's kind of clearing up some of those basic misconceptions as well. Um, but what is the, you mentioned, you, you mentioned it a couple of times today, that Italian, whatever the tax uh, implications yeah. are and the, what, what is that? They've got a couple programs. Uh, so Greece rolled one out, Italy rolled one out. They're kind of based on the Switzerland model. It's a lump sum. So if you if you have a high income, uh, you pay a hundred thousand euros a year. If you're married, it's one twenty five, and that's all you pay. And it's more flexible than like what Portugal's system was. It's like where if you want to have your company in a tax haven and pay zero, you can do that. You live in Italy, whatever amount of time per year, and then you pay them this this lump sum. Um, so that's kind of based on the, Sw the, the Swiss system with different cantons. You can kind of negotiate different rates, but it's, it's cheaper than Switzerland. Um, and, and you can get citizenship in Italy, uh, maybe in Greece. So that's kind of a flat amount. So if you make a million dollars a year or a million euros a year, that's, you know, it's 10% basically. Um, they also have in Italy, uh, incentives and they're going to shorten it this year for how long you can do it. And they're going to take away some of the most aggressive incentives. But you can reduce your tax rate, like as a freelancer, between fifty and seventy percent, wherever depending on where you want to live in the country. So, like in the in the north, it'd be like fifty percent reduction. So, if the tax rate is fifty percent, you pay twenty five. If you want to live in the south, I think it's going to go down to seventy percent. So, if the tax rate's fifty, you pay fifteen. Um, so it's not zero, but if you want lifestyle, I mean, that's a much you know better deal. One of the things that I've been thinking today is you travel around the world, you have businesses in various locations, bank accounts in various locations, and you mentioned about being able to use different currencies. If someone put a gun to your head and said you have to have all of your life savings into one currency that isn't the US dollar, all right. what would it be? 
I'm glad that doesn't happen. I, I, certainly there's some people who I'm say I'm not threatening Bitcoin. you. I promise I'm not threatening you. <laughs> uh, yeah, be careful on the U.S. You gotta, you know, they're they're pretty aggressive over there. I, you know, I here's my construct. There's judgmental and there's not judgmental. Um, and so I think Singapore is a pretty non-judgmental country, i.e. if you go there on like an African passport, they look at the list. Is your passport in the list? Okay, there. Okay, here you go. 90 days. Welcome. Whereas if you do that in the UK, it's like, yeah, you got a visa, but like, eh, you know, I think if you're going to hold a currency, that policy applies equally. Uh, one of the wealthiest clients we've ever worked with says, I, I, you know, I'm from a place that like the West doesn't like. I'm against my country, but I'm from a place like the country the West doesn't like. I don't trust the UK. I don't want my money in UK banks. I wouldn't want to live in the UK. And it's, a, it's just, I mean, for better or worse, there's a judgment of like, we like these people, not like these people. I, I would probably say the Singapore dollar, it's based around a basket of different currencies. Um... It's the freest economy in the world. Um, they do a great job running it. I mean, name a place where retail banks are lending money to the central bank. Um, I, I would say sing the Singapore dollar. What about you? So you, let's say you're going around to smaller banks in these emerging or frontier countries or whatever. Can you actually put a significant amount of money deposited into the bank accounts there? I mean, you can do whatever you want. Uh, should you is the question. Um, <laughs> All right, okay, so that first that question, and then also how do you assess bank risk? What's a good way to assess bank risk? Well, I mean, look at the bank failures in the U.S. last year. I mean, there are more bank failures in the U.S. than I think pretty much every other country combined. Um, so I, I mean, I think the risk is in the U.S. Now, you have the FDIC, which is basically broke has less than 1% of all the money. I mean, if, if you had a couple of big bank failures, they're wiped out. And so you're basically dependent on, is the US Congress going to bail out banks? Uh, I'm not so convinced that, you know, oh, I've got millions of dollars in my bank account. Does the US Congress really want to be bailing out with taxpayer dollars in an increasingly kind of populist country, people who had millions of dollars in the bank? I'm not sure if it comes to that they're going to. So I mean, I look at banks in places like Singapore that are some of the highest rated in the world. Um, and that's not an emerging economy, but some of those banks might have operations in other countries. I mean, you look at a country we mentioned, Cambodia. There are stable Asian banks that opened up offices in Cambodia. People are going and investing in Cambodia. They're building, my friend's strategy is he's buying real estate on corners in the city center that one day will get torn down to build skyscrapers <laughs> or shopping malls because they're doing it. I mean, when I first went to Cambodia, they had like one skyscraper. Now they're they're going up everywhere. It's like uh, a front running gentrification. Front. That's a that's a good uh, it's like a band name or a book name <laughs> or something. Um. So, like, yeah, am I gonna get go to Cambodia invest in like you know some local bank? I mean, no, I'm not gonna put as much money there. Uh, am I going to go to Armenia and invest in the bank that's like owned by a guy? I mean, this like in Serbia, I mean, <laughs> there are some banks like the 18th largest bank is like it's owned by like a guy. Uh, no, but I can go to Armenia and there's banks that, like there's there's French banks. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to feel comfortable doing that because like, do you think if that French bank in Armenia collapses that nobody in France is going to pull their money from that bank? Of course they are. So they have to make sure they move the money around. So I, I mean, I think the risk is based on. Um, the, the quality of the institution. I mean, in Georgia, the two largest banks are traded on the London Stock Exchange. It doesn't mean they can't go under, just like banks in the US were on the US, on New York, US Stock Exchange, they went under. But I think that if you look at those factors, um, you can find decent banks. You know, in a country like Ecuador, um, it's a lot of credit unions, very high interest rates. Um, the US dollar is the official currency, which I actually kind of like because if anything ever happens, like they're not going to like force you to take their currency. But, you know, the banks are, are, there's no big, huge banks that you would trust with, like, all your life savings. Um, I, I think for me, the point is I wouldn't trust anyone with my life savings. I mean, think about it. Um, and Look at Nigel Farage in the UK. Whether you like him or not, eh, well, you know what? We just don't want your business anymore. I mean, that can happen anywhere. Um, so, I mean, I've had things happen to me where they're like, you know, 
what who oh you're charging for the like yeah you're not really the kind of client we want um and then what do you do like the same bankers that want you to like oh give us all your business are the same ones that would cut you off at the knees so i don't care how stable the bank is i don't want any bank to have all my money um i just don't but you know, for me, yeah, I might put, you know, if you put a million dollars in Singapore, would you put a hundred thousand dollars in the bank of Georgia? Um, obviously, you know, in some of those emerging world banks, if you're willing to take on other currencies, I mean, the Georgian Lari has done incredibly well in the last couple of years. Meanwhile, you made 13% interest. So if you don't have any better places to park your money, that's an interesting kind of diversification. There's some countries, if you do that, you can get a residence permit, for example. So it's like, how does, how does this stuff all work together? I wouldn't move $200,000 to a Dominican Republic bank but if you told me, oh, we'll give you a fast track to citizenship, I, I'd be, I'm interested in that, right? So um, I think it all comes down to what are you getting out of the deal? Um, higher interest rates, residence, citizenship, um, or just in the case of like, you know, in a Cambodia, it's probably safer than you think. I'll give you one more thing. There's banks in places like the Bahamas. They don't even keep your money. They just have accounts at bigger banks all around the world that would never take you as a client. You know, BNB Paribas in France or Qatar National Bank, Qatar. Oh, God. They They're just like the, the, the StubHub ticket reseller of bank accounts. They're basically just, yeah, I mean, they're small banks. They take your deposits and they just have your money somewhere. They don't make loans, right? I mean, like, why is it like the U.S. banks get in so much trouble? I mean, they just lend out to the hilt. Uh, and they're, you know, they're so... Uh, aggressive in some cases. You go to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is actually opening up more now for banking, but why has Hong Kong historically been so difficult to get a bank account? The banks literally don't want more money. They're so conservative. They have nowhere to put it. That's wild. That is absolutely crazy. What do you make of the uh, of the meme of the passport bro? Because you have been doing this for significantly longer than that meme has come about but there is a you know a strong trend at the moment of especially western especially men deciding that there is a problem with the culture or the dating or the government or whatever it is and then going right yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm out of here is this uh, were you a, an early adopter of this or is this sort of playing into your guys's culture in some way what do you what are you seeing i i, I don't i don't I'll be honest, I don't entirely know. I, I, my thought is that that Passport Bro is kind of more focused on the dating element, right? I mean, that's kind of a, the core, a core driver of it. Um, I, you know, I think for me, many, many, many years ago, um, I mean, I, I, I was an entrepreneur. I wanted to be an entrepreneur at 12 years old. It wasn't cool back then. Like, now it's cool. It wasn't cool when I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so, um, you know, I wasn't the most popular guy. You're just and some weird kid. Yeah, just kind of like, who's this, this the guy wants to start a business? Well, you're a freak. Uh, I remember like being 21 and my friends would drag me to bars and girls would like, you know, make fun of me because I, like, I would go to like, you know, business meetings and it was embarrassing in retrospect, like, you know, go to these business meetings, but like, like, why are you wearing cufflinks? Like, what are you, a weirdo or something? And I remember being like 22 or 23 and I was on one of my early trips and I met this girl from China and she's like, all the stuff that everyone else thought was weird, she's like fascinated by. Like in Asia, it's like, what is it? Like you're 23 and you have like a business and you're making money and like it's growing. They're like that's pretty, like that's pretty like solid. Like nobody in China would be like under 50 would be doing that. Like that's pretty cool. And it kind of showed me this kind of arbitrage opportunity. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've, you know, dated people around the world. It's, it's interesting. I never looked at it as something where, you know, I've never wanted to be one of these guys where it's like I'm going to places I, I've never chosen a place for dating like Kuala Lumpur, probably not a great dating location. Um, but that's probably why some of the people don't choose it. Um, I mean, Thailand or Indonesia is probably better. So I've never really chosen a place based on, on dating. Um, but you know, I, I've enjoyed, you know, meeting people from different places. I, I, I you know, I, I never wanted to make dating kind of the only aspect, but I certainly think that, um, People should seek competition in their life. I think the biggest thing, I mean, you look for competition for a restaurant. You look for competition if you're buying a product. I mean, people use apps and how can I save $3 buying this product somewhere else? Why don't you use competition for your taxes and for the government that serves you? Why don't you use competition for the people that you meet? And again, I mean, really, is your 
whether you just want to find a, a short-term relationship or whether you're looking for your soulmate or whatever you whatever it is, are the odds that they live around you? I mean, really, out of, out of all the people, out of 8 billion people, the person that matches you happened to also be born in Cleveland, Ohio. Like, it seems ridiculous to me, right? And, and if you look back throughout human history, I mean, people didn't have so many options. They just learned to live with it. But like, you lived in a village and there were 50 people and you just like chose one. And really, those are the happiest relationships. Those are the most fulfilling relationships. So I, I mean, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not the guy. I remember we were touring real estate in Medellin years ago, and people wanted to buy property for Airbnb, and we would go to some of the buildings, and they're like, "Oh, this one, uh, the government's for Airbnb, but the building banned Airbnb." And one one place we went, they told a story of some woman was coming home with her child and a guy was uh, <clears throat> being uh, serviced in the elevator. Like they open the elevator door opens and there's this guy with, with, you know, with a woman and, and it's like, yeah, we don't want these people coming here anymore. Obviously the idea that an American guy goes to Colombia and wants to find someone to, to date. I see nothing wrong with that at all. Some people do. I, uh, that's ridiculous, but obviously I don't, I don't, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to have a certain level of class about it that we're not uh, doing things in elevators. You know, that's that's the the optimal way to do it. Look, Andrew, I I really I love your work. I think it's a very first principles approach to people who live on a rock, and these lines around it are pretty arbitrarily drawn, apart from the oceans, and even there they weren't done of your own choosing. And to think about it from first principles, I really really like it. I think your input is is massively needed and and really hugely uh like inspiring actually so I, I really i really love all of the stuff that you're doing if someone wants to get started uh with this if they said right i'm bought in uh, this sounds like it's something that's kind of cool what are the first places that they should go we have a youtube channel i think over 2500 videos we put something out uh you know 15 16 times a month with these ideas you can watch and get the vibe um our website we've got almost that many articles, nomadcapitalist.com. If you want it a bit more aggregated, I wrote a book called Nomad Capitalist. It's on Amazon. It's more storytelling than specific ideas. We talk about some of the ideas. We talk about what's not possible. We talk about you know, what you can do through the lens of 15 years of my exploring this. So the, the book is a way to aggregate it down into a shorter read. Uh, and then we host this, this annual event called Nomad Capitalist Live, and we bring a curated list of people who Everything from frontier market investing to, you know, giving birth overseas to lowering <laughs> your taxes. We bring some of our staff that talks about our client work. So, you know, from free to ten bucks to live events. And then you'll um, do white glove service. I'm going to guess as well for the people that need it. Yeah, if you have you know a, a mid six figure income or a low seven figure net worth or above, we work with people all the way up to you know billionaires to put together these holistic strategies. Because you heard me multiple times throughout. Uh, saying, okay, well, this bank account probably doesn't work on its own, but if you got a citizenship because you opened it, like, you know, you want to you wanna kind of consider the holistic nature. Uh, and you have to consider the holistic nature given our, our tax conversations. I mean, nothing works in a vacuum. You can't just put your company in the British Virgin Islands and not move and think you're going to save tax because there's all kinds of rules around how that works. And so you have to understand that. And so that's what we help people figure out is, is not only the known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns. Hell yeah. Andrew, I appreciate you. Thank you for today. Thank you. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe.